What's up, everybody? Welcome to Content Matters. My name is Alex Felice. I'm here with my good friend, Sean. What up, what up? Happy Saturday. How you doing, Alex? Is it Saturday? It is. It's going to be a good one, yeah. I'm going to go surfing today. And uh, This show is for anybody who is a content there. creator or an entrepreneur who wants to you know, find ways to create content, visually stunning content together. And we'd like to be at the forefront of the, the content revolution. And uh, today we're going to have a, we've got a couple of questions, a couple of, couple of current events to go over, and uh, we're going to get right into it. Is that good? Yeah, sounds great. Okay, first sounds things first. We just went through this, you and me, um, how to get your mirrorless or DSLR camera into your computer um, to get high-res content without a, you know, it's actually, it's actually not that hard of a problem, but it is one of those things where if you don't know how to do it, then you don't know how to do it, and it can be very difficult. Yes? Yes, it's, I would say definitely double the time that you think it'll take to set up, because you're going to more likely than not run into some technical difficulties. Yeah, so the easiest way to do this uh, is to buy the Elgato 4K cam link. It's $95 on Amazon. They used to be like 300 bucks, but now a lot of people use them, so I think they've come down. Um, there's some all other alternatives that I think we're going to try out. I'd love to, I'd love to just buy some and try them out for 15, 20 bucks. But what you need is the video capture card, not just the cable. However, I'll say all that. However, if you are on Canon, Canon built a EOS utility, um, piece of software that I just plug a USB-C into my camera. And now I have an R5, so I don't know if it works on all Canons, but, um, I know that they have come out with a specific utility to, to try to solve this. And now my Canon is plug and play into my laptop. Nice. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I ordered the two that you sent, so we'll see how that goes. Because uh, if, if it can work for 18 bucks as opposed to 95, then uh, that's a good deal. Yes, yes. And the Elgato Cam Link only comes in USB-A. So you need a USB-A to C converter. And, I, and that'll work, but then... You know, if you're on a laptop, you get a weird little connection. I don't like that. So the, there are some $18 options that, that have USB-C. So we're going to try those out. And we'll report nice. back next week. We will report back, let you know what we find, and we'll drop the links in the description. Will we? Somebody's going to do that. I don't think it's going to yeah. be me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Although, uh, I, I can do that. No. <laughs> um, all right, so how, how is your week going? Did you work on anything fun? What you working on? Yeah, um, working on... Brandon Turner's podcast, obviously, A Better Life with Brandon Turner. Numbers are coming up uh, slowly, but they're coming up. The most interesting thing about content is, and, and which is the whole reason why I want to do this podcast, the, whole, the most interesting thing about content is that uh, all content rises if you do it long enough. Not the best content, just the longest content. And that is a very difficult mindset for people to get through, myself included. I'm not the most consistent person, but... You know, I started my first podcast back in 2017, just screwing around, and I bet you if I had just stuck with it, it would have been, it could have been big by now. Mm -hmm. But, um, but our content is going well. We've we had a great uh, guest come out. The we got seven, eight more episodes in the pipeline. We got a. Uh, I'll give you some insider scoop. Um, the movie that just recently came out, The Sound of Freedom, was about. It's about a guy. I haven't seen it. Yet. It's about a guy named Tim Ballard who goes to Columbia to save some kids from human trafficking. Tim Ballard agreed. He's going to come out to Maui. He's going to be on our podcast. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. How so, did you guys get in touch with him? What was that approach like? Yeah. Uh, look. To be fair, Brandon Turner is uh, very well connected, and he knows a guy who knows him. And I guess Tim Ballard's kind of on the podcast circuit right now, so he agreed. To, I mean, and asking people to come out to Maui is not that hard of an ask. Sure, yeah. Who doesn't want to go? Yeah, but I will say this. What's interesting is if you have a, a, an audience, right, and you have a platform. Now, those usually go hand in hand. But let's just say, you know, Brandon has an audience, so he gets invited to do things and go to places, and he gets connections that just, you know, if you don't have that, that social capital, right, it's like, it's like money. It can buy things. Well, audience is social capital, and it can buy different things. You know, the transaction looks different. So he gets invited to places. He gets invited to people. And then you have a platform. So not only do you get to, to, to like, talk to these people, but then you get to give them something and say, hey, look, I will spread your message on my platform. Now, those things have to be aligned. Uh, but that's what I like about, about what we're doing here is I really want to talk to um, both entrepreneurs and creatives about that merge. And so as this audience grows, we'll be able to leverage that to get bigger, 
you know, guests to come say, hey, look, you know, come tell your story. Come, come spread your message here. Absolutely. The one thing that you yeah. said that struck me with, uh, you know, staying consistent with the content, it'll eventually rise. I filmed uh, Brandon Bouchard's Mastermind uh, earlier last week in Los Angeles. And if you've never had a chance to see any of his content or even see him in person, you definitely should because he was incredible. He did a six and a half hour one man show off the cuff improv. And in one of his segments, he is talking about how when you get started at something, you're going to be terrible and that's natural, but you just have to keep going and, you know, remove the self judgment. And he was showing the screenshots of his first video setups and he was saying he was awful. He wanted to quit. He couldn't believe that his wife was still married to him because he couldn't even introduce his name on camera. Like he was actually really funny, which I wasn't expecting, but he said, after staying consistently posting regular on schedule, after two years, over a hundred videos, he made $4 million online on his sales uh, through his programs and whatnot, just by being consistent. So it was like definitely inspiring to hear and then like to see firsthand somebody talking about, you know, a little bit of their journey, specifically in the beginning when they sucked and then having the proof too, because he had like screenshots and like the pictures, he was just like, and he's like, this was the best picture I took. And like, he just had the crowd roaring. So that was really cool to hear. And uh, also just a great experience overall. Learned a lot. And that brings me to one of my questions I want to ask for you because I was collaborating with some videographers, first time working with them, and uh, it was a little miscommunication, but you know, normally if you're gonna swap footage with everyone to collab on an edit, it would be, you know, all shoot the same temperature balance, picture profile. And I wanna know, what do you shoot on when you're shooting? Do you have a favorite picture profile? Do you go straight color, straight from the camera, and then just correct it in Premiere? What's your process look like? Yeah, I, that's a good question. I haven't shot with that many, you know, my, my role at Better Life is creative director. So I try, I, I'm trying to get people who are better at what they do. Like my videographer that I work with now out here, he's better than me. And so I'm like, look, you just do it. You don't need, you don't need me. I can't, add, I can't, I can't do anything better than he does. So, um, but I, that said, that said, um, I do like sharing white balance. Obviously it just makes life so much easier. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, he shoots a red camera. And I'll shoot my Canon R5. So he'll work in DaVinci, which will, I, I, I don't work in DaVinci that much, but I guess it'll, it'll color, it'll match color grades. So that makes things a little bit easier. But what I try to do is shoot the biggest, the, the, the highest performing um, color like uh, profile that I can, which is log. So I shoot. I shoot C-Log 2 if I'm on my C70. I shoot C-Log 3 if I'm on my R5. And that just gives you the, the most amount of, um, of leeway. Uh, I shoot everything in 24 frames a second. So okay. Everything I shoot is 24 frames a second. So I, that being said, it's not a, if you're working in a collaborative environment, it doesn't really matter what you shoot. It matters what we are going to make. And so a lot of times, like, and for example, like what the client wants. So if the client's going to want, if, if, if the, whoever's in charge says, hey, we're going to shoot everything in, you know, um, uh, 4K 30, then we shoot 4K 30. So I don't have a preference, or excuse me, I have a preference, but it's just my preference. I like 24 frames, but um, we shoot our podcast in 24 frames. We shoot our, our, all our content in 24 frames and we shoot everything in C-Log because I have my color profile set up. So it doesn't take that long to, to edit many things. Sure. You answered my second question because the next one was gonna be what frame rate, but I completely agree. It depends on the circumstance and what the client wants. Yeah. So, so for those who may not understand, like if an entrepreneur is like, what, what does frame rate matter? Or, or a, a newer content creator doesn't know the difference, then I'll say basically this 24 frames is what is what's considered cinematic. It's what movies are shot in. It's got a little bit of a motion blur. 30 frames a second is what television started getting shooting up, shot on. And that's what most content is made. Your phone probably defaults at 30 frames. It's, it's the most probably versatile. 60 frames is a trap more times than not, it's a trap. And what you do is you buy a camera or uh, you see something and you see 60 and our American brains say bigger is better. And so you think 60 frames must be better than 30 frames. God, it must be way better than 24 frames. Uh, but the reality is 60 frames looks weird. The only time it's really good is for like action shots. Um, 
the real use that for videographers like me and Sean that use 60 frames is for slow-mo. You take a high frame rate and then you slow it down in post and you get slow motion. That's why 120 frames has become so popular and sometimes you see things like uh, you know, higher than that, 240 or for like extreme cameras, they'll do a thousand frames a second and they do hyper, hyper, hyper slow-mo. But if you are a content creator and you don't know what to do, uh, 30 frames a second is your safest, most versatile, most universal choice. You can't really go wrong. Would you, would you agree with that? I would agree. I like 30, like 60. If I'm doing sports or somebody skateboarding or something, 120 is fun to play with. Uh, get that really slow-mo. Uh, but yeah, I, I like to hang, I mean, a lot of times I'm on the gimbal too and I like to, you know, come around the edge or come around the curtain and then like maybe slow it down. So sometimes I'll, I'll be on 60 frames Maybe a little bit more than other people or more than I should, but it's just because I, I know for the edit, then I have a little bit of flexibility with the speed ramps and whatnot. And um, I'm a 60 frames uh, per second addict. So like, I, I do like 60, but um, I, I, sh I could probably use 30 a little bit more. Yeah, I think, yeah, and we can go to the nuance here for a moment. Like 60 frames is great for B-roll for me. Mm -hmm. um, for static, for things that don't move, if I'm just getting like places, then 60 frames, because it doesn't matter. It's when human beings move. That's when the 24 really comes into play. That's when I, or the 24 or the 30, that's when the frame rate really starts to make a difference. Where if you're shooting in 60 or 120 and you're watching humans, they're gonna look a little, jar, uh, a little jarring. But if you're just shooting like a building, then it almost doesn't matter. The only difference is with 60, you can kind of correct some of your instability, your movement instability, but if you're on a gimbal, yeah. Uh, but then you get into the thing where it's like, how much all day do you want to be flipping back and forth between 24 and 60? Um, another pro tip for content creators is uh, when I'm at a shoot, the first thing I do is I save a, a profile one on my camera, my custom as 24 and whatever the white balance is. And the second one I shot at, shoot at 60 and then I'm just switching back and forth. So I don't have to think about it. Mm -hmm. That's smart. Yeah. Dial it in and then always be prepared. My... Uh... My other lesson learned was, um, you know, so I always keep my extra SD cards on me in a little like uh, fanny pack. And uh, the way they had it set up at this event was um, hired a couple of different teams and we all were supposed to kind of send basically the same deliverables. But um, it wasn't, I don't, in my opinion, as a collaborative uh, setup, you know, because like typically you'd have like one person on vlog camera and then they're editing the vlog one person filming vertical they're editing their uh verticals but this was kind of a, a you know a collab in the sense where we were all filming but we were all supposed to um capture the same stuff so a lot of times there's double shooting and that stemmed because one person in the group uh told another guy i'm not going to be sharing my footage with you after the client said, oh, like all of you should share your footage. And so it's like, okay, whatever. And uh, me and the other guy um, that was told, you know, that, um, hey, I'm not sharing your footage. Him and I just kind of instantly clicked. And when we were out getting some drone establishing shots, he was like, oh crap, my card's full. I need to format it. And I was like, don't sweat, bro. Use one of mine. And he was like, really? And that like opened up Pandora's box where like, then we became friends. And it's like, dude, like, I'm not here to compete. Like, even though maybe one of us will get picked, like, let's just create the best thing we can. We're both here all day. Let's learn. And I don't care if you use my card, just give me one back. And then he gave me his card that was full that needed to be formatted as collateral. Cause he's like, in case I forget, you can have this one. And I was like, all right, cool. And, and then he was telling everyone throughout the day, like, yeah, Sean, let me use his card. Like he's a good dude. Like we shared, you know? And so, I always like to make friends with the other creators. I don't have any animosity or, you know, competitive nature with, uh, I think some of the people that might've been there because of the way it was set up, but it was kind of a lesson learned because I feel like not everyone has that collaborative, uh, you know, ideology behind it. And now I got a new friend out of it who does videos. And I just got a, an inquiry for a red carpet gig in LA uh, at the end of the month. And I called the guy that I just met this week because he's based in LA and said, hey, what are you doing on the 27th? So he might be shooting with me again. So you never know where it could lead. Yeah, the, that's what I love about, that's what I want to imbue with this platform is um, uh, artists are habitually very reserved and very guarded. 
and entrepreneurs are very collaborative and very abundant. And if the two people, if you're an entrepreneur who wants to work with artists, you have to understand that they're like, you know, very much, they're artists, it's me, right? It's a lot of ego. And, uh, and, and if you're an, uh, a creator who wants to work with entrepreneurs, it's like you have got to think bigger. It is never going to be, a, if you want to work with a big entrepreneur and you want to work on a big production, it is never going to be just you. You cannot do it all. So like we have got to uh, have a collaborative nature. In fact, uh, when I first started in um, photography, I met a woman who, I had, she, had, she had something. She had like, I was very new, right? It was like my first, second week with a camera. I was brand new. And she has like these little USB cards that had like, pictures on them as her company and so she would give these out like hell I mean this is whatever seven eight years ago whatever she was it was a small town so she was like giving out USB cards as like deliverables and it had like her picture stuff I'm like oh how'd you get those she's like oh, I'm not gonna tell you because they're my secret and at the time I had already been in real estate a little while so I knew I was like okay well that's it's a low ceiling right because like I have Google bro there's nothing that you know that Google doesn't know mm-hmm. um and it just makes you self-limited. So there's a lot of that. But also, um, you know, it's up to all of us to, to grab people who are doing that and say, that's wrong. It's not going to be, um, it, it can't be guarded. You have to be collaborative. Yeah. I think that's a really good point, having that frame of uh, the artists working with entrepreneurs. Because as soon as he said, I mean, you could tell the guy was an artist based on the camera he had. And when I did talk to shooting? him, for, we have uh, a- it was a Sony Z9, like a huge... Oh, yeah, huge no rig and was telling me a little bit about his, you know, production experience and, oh, I've been doing this for 25 years and television. And I think people in Los Angeles have a little bit different. They're a different breed because you got like the filmmakers, you know, the people who are out there that want to be making movies and TV. And then you got other people that just create content, YouTube, social media or commercials. I mean, there's so many different ranges, but it's, that's the biggest distinction between Vegas and LA. The LA people, when I've met them, some people are like, I'm a filmmaker. And it's like, oh, cool. When's the last film you made? And then they're like five years ago. And it's like, oh, great. How's that going? Uh, so dude, LA is, um, LA is sad and it's full of sadness. And that's where sad people get attracted to go. It's sad. Terrible place. Mm. Sad. Sorry, LA. Sorry whatever it is, 20 million people that I just dumped on. <laughs> <laughs> it, LA, it, it's I was a dream in, crusher. I was, just in, um, I was just in LA and then San Diego for the last few days for this uh, retreat that we went to. And, um, and uh, yeah, the place is terrible. Sad, it's ugly, it's gross, it's expensive. Traffic's abhorrent. There's no reason to go to LA other than, um, I think, you know, if you're sad. If you're a sad person who, um, who's wrapped up in their ego and uh, wants to feel good about yourself, then you go to LA. So sorry. What do you uh, think of San of which, Diego? Oh, uh, uh, yeah. Go uh, it's fifteen percent better. Okay. <laughs> maybe okay. maybe that's generous. I think it's it, it looked the same. I don't know. Uh, it was still crowded. It was still expensive. It was still traffic. Um, the weather was okay. Uh, you know what? To be fair, I'm wildly spoiled by living in Maui because I was saying all weekend. I'm like, you know, you don't appreciate how how good Maui is until you have to go to places with shitty weather like San Diego. <laughs> oh wow. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. So um. Yeah, we're here to. I'm, I'm out here today. It's you know sunshine and palm trees. I'm gonna go surfing later. Yeah, I'm spoiled. Life's rough. Um, yeah, if you live in LA, um, move to Las Vegas. If you can't, I mean it's cheaper, so I know you can afford it. If you can live, if you can afford to live in LA, you can afford to live anywhere. So why don't you just live somewhere better? I don't understand. Um, there's opportunity everywhere. Go to Austin. Austin's cheap. A lot of content opportunity. Um, but speaking of ego, I. Uh, Somebody said on a, on a piece of content I did with somebody else last week, they said, people do create content for two reasons, ego and marketing. And I thought about that. It makes sense. And the more I thought about it, the more I'm like, this, this actually changed my frame a little bit. I'm curious what you thought about it because I don't like, if you do things for ego, unless you really actually have a huge ego, then you are not going to be consistent. Right? Oh, did I lock up? Nope. Uh, you locked, locked up, up, but I can hear you. I locked up on my side. Yeah, I don't know what's going on. What am I... My camera die. Remember this happened last time? Oh man. It's all right. Um, yeah. Somebody, somebody actually reached out and they were like, um, they were busting my chops for the camera dying. So, um, so it happened again. It's okay. Was it Cam? Um, what's that? Oh, I said, was it Cam? Coffee with Cam. Was it Cam? <laughs> Cameron's moving out to Maui, actually. I'm excited. Um, we're going to do, we're going to do some content. I got to do some content with Cam when he gets here. Um, 
But, con uh, but so content is done for either ego or marketing, and I thought about that for a while because ego is a really bad way to do um, content. But a lot of times, you know, I'm not like a marketing guy, you know? I don't always like selling stuff. So it really made me realize, I'm like, dude, I have got to not just be a sales guy marketing, but I've got to take the knowledge that I have like this. I got to make it a little bit more formal. And I hate to say it, but like not just sell it, but I have to provide it to people in a f more formalized way. And then the content will have a purpose. Does that make sense? Instead of just doing content for content's sake. Like it has to have a purpose. Otherwise it's just, it has to have a, 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 a value proposition. Otherwise it's just ego. So what do you think about all that? That's an interesting framework. I think now that you say it, I do think a lot of people who do do it for ego would probably say they're doing it for marketing. Um, after working with a lot of entrepreneurs who are creating content who have audiences, uh, it's sometimes a slippery slope to distinguish, you know, like, are you really doing it to help people? Or are you really doing it because you can help people, but they're also going to be paying you to get the help? Um, well, to be clear, I think both is actually the best way to do it. But I think there's a lot of entrepreneurs that do content, but they don't actually have a way to convert. They don't even have a way to convert customers. Not really. Or it's a very inefficient way. Um, and so they're just like, oh, I have to make content and I like being on camera. So I, I, let me give you a better example. I mean, there, I know there's entrepreneurs that call you up and they're like, hey, follow me around for a day and just make me look good on camera. And it's like, what are we making? And it's like, I don't know. Just follow me around for a day and make me look good on camera. And it's like, oh, okay, gotcha. That's, that's the, the ego. And it comes back to what we talked about last week, which is, um, you know, create for the edit in mind. Or create, actually more than just the edit, but create for the release. Where is this going and what is it trying to accomplish? If I start with that, then I can create much better. I agree. Create with the edit in mind. That is something that as I've been looking at the footage, because so the guys I swapped cards with, and this is the other kind of talking point I want to talk about was always, you know, surround yourself in the room with people that are better than you. Just find a way to get in the room because Brendan had posted on Instagram looking for a videographer in L.A., slid in the DMs, had a funny little quote, you know, sent him the, the reel. He liked the reel. And then it was like, what else do you have? And I sent him some case studies and my gear list. And then we started the dialogue. And uh, I was kind of committed before uh, I even got confirmation. I booked the flight and I was like, I'm going to go. And Dude, um, good for you. Love that. Yeah. So I still have that hunger, you know, like I just got to be there. Um, and then the guys that I met, and that I became friends with when, when I was looking at their footage, I was amazed. Cause I was like, I thought the shots, you know, some of the shots that I got were good, but throughout the day it was so much going on and it was kind of a last minute thing. Like we had a, I talked to him on zoom via Friday and then booked the flight and I was out there at seven in the morning, Monday. And so it wasn't a lot of planning or time to review. And it was kind of one of the, one of the first events that he had had since uh, COVID and the other guys I shot with were like phenomenal. And so like, that's why I was really happy that I got another potential gig in LA at the end of the month where I could hire both of them. Cause I told one of them, I called him after I was like, Scott, your footage was fire and I want to work with you. And I want you to teach me everything that you did at this last gig. Cause I was looking at your clips and like, Holy smokes, you're good. And he's like, thanks man. And so, uh, you know, shooting for the edits huge because I could see he was doing that with some of the clips and throughout the day I was, I was, I'm not going to lie. I was outside my comfort zone. It was a new crew. I was tired cause I couldn't sleep cause I was excited. And I don't think it was like my best performance of like footage as I was reviewing it. And so always try to keep that in mind. I'd say is, you know, shoot for the edit, be intentional. Don't just spray and pray because I had a couple clips where I was doing that, if I'm being honest. And uh, I was just really happy, you know, fortunate to be there to meet some people that were better than me and uh, to just learn and work with them. So, yeah, that's a really good point. Also, I think it's important to for people to find that, like what I tell, what I try to tell people is like be multi talented, multi disciplined. And so can you be the best artist like I know artists that are really really good but they have no no self marketability so they can't get gigs and so it's like okay can you partner with them and say hey look you're better than me but I'll bring you the money that's 
that's a good trade of value where then you don't have to be the best at both things. Because I think what happens with people, especially, um, you know, I'm kind of growing out of this in a weird way. Like just my age, just my experience has given me just enough life that I'm like, oh, I'm good at this very unique subset of multiple skills. I'm like, oh, here, right? Videographer, entrepreneur, real estate. It's like, oh yeah, there's a little Venn diagram that I fit into really, really nicely that, you know, not everybody else has. And so like, am I the best videographer? Not even close, right? I mean, and, and so, but you don't have to be the best. You have to be the best at what you do, which can be wildly unique rather than, um, you know, the, like I said, the best at one thing. I mean, there's people on Instagram or YouTube that have more followers than Peter McKinnon, probably not that many, that are in the, the video world, right? But it's like, you know, they teach equipment or they teach you how to be good at YouTube on camera rather than just be the camera guy. I mean, Peter's sort of an anomaly, but... Um, I'd say two things that to that. Visibility beats ability. So if they know who you are, you don't have to be the best. And you don't have to be the best videographer and this is kind of redundant, but I like the saying, you just have to be the best that they know. So I like, say that know, all the time. Yeah. I say that all the time. Yeah. And I live by that because like whenever I'm feeling down, I'm like, oh man, I'm not that great. I just have to remind myself. I just have to be the best that they know. And you only need to know, you know, yep, that has to be you for just a few people, you know? Yeah. And entrepreneurs don't know artists. Mm -hmm. So they're like, who in my network? If you're just one that's like me. And then you come out, you do good work, you're easy to work with, they produce content that's acceptable, even good, you're in the money forever. Because again, uh, all business is people business, right? Like I'm never in the real estate business, I'm always in the people business. So I don't buy, like even when I buy a house, I don't buy the house from the house, I buy the house from a person. So I just need to know the people that have the houses. If I wanna fund the deal, I just know the people that have all the money. I don't rent the house, somebody else rents the house. I just need to know a property manager. Uh, and so it's the same thing with cameras. Uh, uh, Brandon didn't hire the best videographer in the world. He hired the one he knew. Now, I'm the best one he knew because he knew a couple, but um, I was also, I might not even have been the best one because, again, here's another thing. It's like um, I'm the easiest, I'm the best one that is also easy to work with that he likes having around because with cameras, it's intimate. And, and, and this is something that both entrepreneurs and artists inherently, or maybe not inherently, but like um, they know subliminally. And, and, and every camera person in the world knows this. There is an inherent trust factor. The, cap, the operator has to be able to look at the talent, capture everything, and then pick out, ju pick out just the good stuff or <clears throat> learn how to direct the talent to be better. And that is a trust thing because no talent wants to you know, work a day <coughs> and then get home and be like, well, the footage looks good, but I sound terrible. Why did you send me this thing where I sound like an idiot or I sound stupid or why didn't you take this, this cut out or whatever the case? So... There is a trust factor that goes into content production. You have to be able to make somebody look good, not just visually, but like, you know, you have to be able to get them to talk and speak and look and sound good on camera. And, you know, that's a personality trait. That has nothing to do with camera skills. So love that you said that. Yeah, absolutely. I think the trust factor is huge. Personality factor is huge. Knowing the prompts, making them, you know, my joke uh, when I was talking to one of the guys there, they're like, so you, you just do videography stuff? And I'm like, no, I make people look cool and I make them smart, you know, I make them look smart, you know, cut out all the stuff where they don't sound good. And he started laughing. And then the other thing that I've been working on too, I don't know if you do this, but especially if they're doing kind of vlog talking head, but because we don't want to talk back, I will try to talk back with my face. So I'll like smile and nod and, uh, I noticed that not everyone always does that. So I think like just kind of having like body cues and physical body language when you're filming to give them that kind of feedback like, oh, this was good and to keep going. Because it, it does feel awkward when you have a person with a camera just staring at you and they're looking at the screen and they're just like, go ahead. So yeah, it's interesting. The camera per people are thought of as just like the camera operators, but the reality is we have to be highly charming and um, and yeah, because you're, 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 like you said, you're trying, to, you're trying to encourage them with your body language. You're telling jokes all day. I'm, you know, that's, you know, I get by on my charm, right, and my smack talk, right? Everybody likes a little smack, smack talk. So you make people laugh, and then you make them feel comfortable, and then you encourage them, and, you know, then, they're, then they feel good about when they, when they did the content or when they're about to do the next piece of content or, you know, hey, don't say that. Say this. You'll sound better. Like, that stuff all, that all sort of stuff adds up. It's so interesting. I know a lot of camera people that... Um, you know, if I had an Alex to put me on camera, you know, I'd be deadly. 
So there's a lot of camera people out there with a lot of like charisma, a lot of personality. They just, they happen to be givers, right? They happen to be givers. They're like, I want to make other people look good uh, rather than, than egomaniacs uh, mm -hmm. a lot of times. No, yeah, that's great. All right, so I had another question for you. When you're getting into editing or getting into your creative flow, do you have a certain routine to prepare to do the work? Um, no, time block. Okay. I work in bursts, right? I can't do four hours of editing. I can do 30 minutes and then, uh, yeah, I mean, I have my little, I have my little flow, like, uh, especially if it's, if like what I try to do is I try to get draft done. Then I go away for eight hours. Then before I start working on a second draft, I can never get a final edit done in one take. There's no way. Um, so there's things like that. Um, but I also try to get whatever the job is. I try to get it done as soon as possible. I hate having stuff linger. Um, all creativity is gone for like one project, the excitement, the enthusiasm, the, the ideas are gone after a month or, or not even just a month. But like if I go and I shoot something today, and then I can't edit it for three weeks and I have, you know, five, six, ten jobs in between. Like, by the time I come back to this, it becomes now, it's like, okay, get this thing off my plate. It's never the excitement. So I think as far as preparation, the only thing I would say is, like, try to get it done as soon as possible. As soon as, as, soon as the footage is shot, I want to get it done and, and sort of, like, drafted, an 80% draft. And then I'll come back to it and then I'll, I'll shoot it again or I'll, I'll edit it again to make sure. But uh, other than that, let's see. Pick the music first. Yes. Rookie mistake. Pick the music first. If you don't do this, it's a rookie mistake. In fact, the best way to do it is to pick the music before you shoot. That's not easy. But that's hard. Exactly. That's, that's it. I was actually thinking about that before I flew out to LA. I was like, I need to have like a list of 20 songs, but I just never got around to it. Don't do uh, 20. The reason do, do two. Yeah. The, the reason I was asking on the routine, because lately um, I've been working on really keeping my desk clean. But I'll do, uh, so I'll listen to a dance kind of song, you know, where like you feel good, like maybe like a wedding style song, and then make a cup of coffee, and then I turn on the LED lights just for the ambiance, and I'll light a scented candle. And I don't know what it is, but like just doing those things makes me feel like, you know, if we were like a football player and we're like tightening our cleats and putting on the pads, it's like, for me, that is like putting on the pads. I'm like, it is go time. When I turn on these lights, when I smell that scented candle and when I have a cup of coffee with a clean desk, it's like time to work. And then I do the same thing. I'll do time blocks. I do timers too. So like I'll, it, I won't look at my phone. I'll turn off push notifications and it is just work. And yeah. then when the timer goes off, if I have to go to the bathroom or anything else, I can do it. But I almost try to treat it like school or something like, you know, Focus for an hour, take 10 minutes off. Um, right now, I am living in a 600 square foot apartment. I work off of only my laptop, right? This is where I live. This is 90% this is of my house right now. And so I'm sitting here on a makeshift table and, and tripod. Like, I don't have space right now. So we are trying to work on getting an office. It might take another two, three months. But if we can get an office and I can get an office built out, then the game will change. But it's been hard this last six months. I live off out of a desktop, so, uh, out of a laptop. So getting into a flow or a routine of any kind. I mean, in Maui, there's not even a lot of places, coffee shops that have Wi-Fi. So like I work from home. It's not a good, it is not a great work situation. That's a surprising fact I didn't know about Hawaii. That the coffee shops don't have Wi-Fi. At least not in the, in the little town that I live in, Kihei. They, which is why I think we're going to build a co-working space. That would be cool. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, let's, what other questions do you have? Let's, let's start, start wrapping up. Okay, cool. So, well, one of the things I think that's really cool that I admire most about you is you, uh, you kind of did the inverse or the reverse of how other people want to do things, right? So you started in real estate, became, you know, you have financial freedom, and then jumped into, uh, you know, doing camera work and being a creator, and there's tons of creators that I've known that want to do the opposite. You know, they're like, I started doing videography and I'm interested in real estate. Like even me now, like after filming with so many realtors, I'm like, I want to get, you know, a couple properties, not there yet, but building towards it. But it, I just thought it'd be kind of cool to hear more about your journey of, uh, you know, being a real estate investor, 
and then kind of bridging the gap into getting into creativity. Cause I, I do certainly think that you have that, like that flow state to you where you're just like, I don't have to worry about money as much as maybe some other people. And you can turn down certain gigs cause you don't need it. And you're working with Brendan have properties. And I just want to know more of that story. Cause I think it's really inspiring. Dude. Uh, the name of the game is freedom. The name of the game is freedom and freedom comes in many forms. Actually, people don't think about this. They think, uh, Oh, you need a lot of money. And it's like, yeah, I, I said this last time. You don't need that much money. You need control of money. That's the big one. That's the big one is control of money. Secondly, um, yeah, you need like a plan, right? So, well, you need, you need a plan for money. You need to make some sacrifice, like live light. You know, that's a lot of freedom. Living light is like, hey, I don't need anything. I have my camera. You have everything you need. Don't, don't spend any money. That's freedom. Um, and so I started on that journey in like 2013. I was like, hey, I'm broke all the time, perpetually broke. I hadn't picked up a camera yet. I was in car sales, right? I was just pissing, pissing away my time. And I was like, I gotta get my stuff together. So I just started learning about money. That was my first hobby, my first big, that wasn't my first hobby, but that was like my second big hobby. My first hobby was the gym. The second hobby was, um, was make money. And so it's like, what do you, for, like, I, people have this idea that they're going to like, just make enough money that it becomes excessive and then they'll learn how to invest. And I just, I reject that idea. Now that's gonna happen for some people if they're completely obsessed with their business. And that's probably not going to be for most camera people. Most camera people are going to make enough, right? It's not a, a business that I would say, like, if you want to be a billionaire, don't go into cameras. If you want to be a multimillionaire, it's like probably not going to cameras, right? You probably have the same likelihood of make, being a multimillionaire in cameras as you do as a musician. There's just, there's the barrier to entry is low. You know, it's valuable, but not hyper valuable. It's, it's, it's kind of, a, it's hard to outsource, right? So like, I had to, so before I picked up a camera, I learned about money. And I think that's very, very wise for people to do, right? You want to buy houses? You want to invest? What exactly, how much do you need to buy your first property? Like, if you don't know the exact dollar amount, then like, what do you, you don't have a plan. You just have hope. And this is why I say plans are control, right? Like, hey, every time I have $100,000, I can buy a house. Okay, how long to get $100,000? This amount per month. Okay, great. Let's go to work, right? How much can I live on? Okay, this. Everything above this goes into the $100,000 fund and that goes into investments and then that, that compiles. Um, so it was 2013. I was like, I'm going to learn about money because I'm always broke. I'm sick of always being broke. Um, and so I went to college for finance, uh, with the, the G, the GI bill. And I just spent all my days podcast, listening to podcasts about money, listening to the bigger pockets podcast, listening to finance podcasts, um, spending my time doing spreadsheets and just, I, I spent zero dollars, bro. I just sacrificed every single dollar that I made or, or every single thing that I wanted. And I just lived on basically ramen and Kool-Aid for four years and saved every single penny until I had enough to buy a house. At the time it was a foreclosure boom. So it was a little bit easier. I also wasn't buying houses in Las Vegas. I was buying houses in Fayetteville, North Carolina. Another sacrifice that people won't make, right? They, they want to live in LA and they want to be investors and they're making 50, 40 grand a year on the camera. And I'm like, okay. I mean, do it the hardest possible way. That's what you're doing. You're doing it the hardest possible way. Um, you know, a hundred grand buys your house in Fayetteville you know, a house that makes money. Instead, you're going to LA and you need a million or 800,000. It's like, what are you doing? And then, it, and then even then they don't make that much money. So, uh, 2013, 14, I started learning about money and I just started getting control. I said, started setting goals, right? I'm gonna buy 10 houses in 10 years. I'm gonna start saving all my income. I'm gonna save 30% of my income, no matter what, no matter what, every dollar that comes into my bank account, the money goes into future Alex's fund first. Then I figure out how to pay my bills. Then I figure out how to survive. Future Alex comes first. First, last, and always, right? And that just, I just beat that into my head over the last 10 years, and it just works. Every dollar that comes in, 30% goes to um, savings, and that, that savings doesn't get touched. It only gets invested no matter what. I love that. Right. Um, and then, like, once I kind of completed that hobby, and, like, I'm not rich by any means, but I have a good portfolio of real estate. Um, I have a pretty good portfolio of real estate, eight, eight nine houses. And then I, have a, I had two apartments and I sold one, but I have a 52 unit apartment building. So 60 doors, uh, six, six million, $7 million total real estate valuation that I control and something like two or three that's just mine. Um, and, but in 2016, somebody, uh, I figured out along the way, I was like, I don't wanna be, a, I'm not, I don't wanna be really be a real estate entrepreneur. I really just wanted to be an, a real estate investor. Big difference, actually, big difference. And so I just, I started picking up a camera as a fun little way to sort of distract me from 
trying to do too much in real estate, which is really good because in 2020, the real estate market, um, although it continued to go up, it hit retail. There's no more deals. Everybody's paying over what they're worth. And that's never how I want to invest. And so from 2020, I started becoming camera guy full time, traveling the world with my camera, a lot of what you do. Um, but I could do it because I had my seven, eight little rental properties and it kicks off, I don't know, 50, 60 grand a year in passive income. I have a little bit of, um, I have some other, some other investments that pay income. So I, I was doing okay, but you know, 50, 60 grand is enough that you're like, well, I can, I'm not going to starve. I'm not going to starve. Yeah. And the equity and the equity has gone up. So there's a lot of equity sitting there that I could tap into. Oh, I'm sure the um, equity has gone up a lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and I'm going to continue to do it, right? I mean, look, you want a retirement plan? Here's the easiest, most effective, like, retirement plan that will guarantee you to become a multimillionaire, um, like, guaranteed. Buy one house a year. Every year. Forever. Wow, I love that. One house a right? year. We heard it first. So, if you could go to Fayetteville, North Carolina, you could buy a house on a loan if you put 20 grand down. You can put together 20 grand, dude. You could put together 20 grand. Like, if you had a plan. If you're like, okay, what is 20 grand? Well... Well, it's two grand a month. Okay, what if I went off and I, could you, make, could, you make, could you make five grand this month and just live like a pauper, like a peasant, and save two? Well, and you do that every month. And you know what? You could do that. If you actually had that in your mind, you're like, dude, I would char- you would charge more. I don't know you charge for Alex Camacho's thing, but, you know, whatever you charged, I don't know, two, three, four, five grand. You know, what if you charged eight? Yeah. Right? What if you charged eight and you sunk 5,000 of that to your $20,000 fund? I'm like, you're 25% of the way there. And then you get a house in Fayetteville and you're like, is it, is it a, you know, it makes you a hundred bucks a month. Why the fuck would I do that? Alex, a hundred bucks a month. Well, cause in 10 years, it'll make you $500 a month and it'll be a third paid off. And in 20 years, it'll make you a thousand dollars a month and it'll be two thirds paid off. And in 30 years, it'll make you $1,500 a month. No, actually in 15, in, in 30 years, it'll be more than that, right? It'll probably make you two twenty five hundred $2,500 a month and it'll be no debt and it'll be worth 300 grand, 400 grand. And so I'm like, okay, well in 30 years though, you'll have 30 of those. Cause you bought one every year. So like, this is why, this, like when you ask me like my journey about real estate, I'm like, dude, it, it's the same thing as your journey in cameras. You're just, I think camera people are focused on a low dollar hobby, lower dollar hobby. Right. And if you could have like, you're, you're not single. I know you got a, you got a, are you married? No, nope, Just uh, dating. girlfriend. Girlfriend. Yeah. Yeah. You got a girlfriend. Okay, fine. But you don't have kids, right? Do you have kids? No, just a cat. Is she there? Are you looking at? Is she, you yeah, looking yeah, at her? She's, yeah, she's. <laughs> my point is, my point is, dude, you have time for two hobbies. Yeah, you have time for two hobbies. You you can have one hobby that makes you money and one mm-hmm. hobby that keeps you creative, and they can work together in tandem. So, uh, yeah, I had enough to to like get my freedom, and I'm not rich, but a little bit goes a long way, right? You don't need that much money, so that allowed me to get the job out here in Maui. I get paid very well by Brandon. He's incredibly generous. Um, and we're going to continue to do the same thing. I'm going to buy one house a year. And then when the prices of the houses come down or they get a little more lucrative, whatever the case, then I might go buy, you know, sink some, sink some more effort into that. But, um, you know, even if you didn't want to buy houses, if you wanted to buy the stock market, it's like same thing, dollar cost averaging. This is where you need to know, understand money. It's like buy uh, $1,000 worth of stock, the same stock, you know, the ETF, the S and P buy it every month and sometimes it'll go up and sometimes it'll go down. And when it goes down, you get it cheaper. And when it goes up, you spend a little more, but in 10 years it'll go up anyways. So I just dollar cost average with houses. Nice. I love that. One of the things I was thinking about too, when you said that was uh, when you said charge more, I watched a video the other day and they said charging less is a disservice to your clients. Cause then you can't put the same time and attention they need. And what I've noticed when I charge more, and then I can turn down certain gigs. Like everything I had on this week, I, I canceled just so I could do the stuff that I was focused on for uh, the gig in LA. And I was like, when you, when you price it adequately, then you can deliver even a better result because you're putting more attention into it and you're just focusing on maybe one or two things versus five. And um, Also, uh, this is why, I, this platform is why I want to link camera people with entrepreneurs. Entrepreneurs have more money and they are less fussy. It's just that, you know, the $1,200 project that you have, the client wants the most, they're the least happy. The money's the hardest to get out of them, right? And it's, it's just, it's, it's what I call the F customer. 
right? It's the F customer. They're the hardest, they're the least happy, and they pay the least profit. You want the A customer. The customer that pays you the most, they're the happiest, they complain. Brandon is an A customer. He pays me the most. He doesn't actually care that much. I mean, I, I deliver a good quality product, but he's not fussing. He's never like, oh, dude, I wanted it to be like slightly different or the music's not perfect. He's like, just keep working, it's fine. Like, we'll get better. He's the easiest to work with. He pays the most profit and um, yeah, and it's recurring. Yeah. That's great. Go find that's A like customers. A, a plus customer, yeah, no, that's Go awesome. find A plus customers, yeah. yeah. Go find A plus customers, they exist. And if you ask them, if I went to Brandon and I was like, hey, I'll, I'll do this gig for 20 grand a year, I'll do this gig for 30 grand a year, he would have said no. Cause you'd have been like, you think you're only worth 30 grand a year? I need somebody that's worth more than that. So I'm not getting it. He's like, I'm not gonna get a discount. I'm gonna get somebody worse. Or again, entrepreneurs, they don't wanna work around people that don't value themselves, that think low of themselves. They wanna be around people that are abundant minded. Somebody's like, hey dude, I tell people all the time. And they're like, hey Alex, can you come out and do this gig? I'm like, you know what dude, I'm very expensive. You might wanna go get somebody shitty. <laughs> Right? Um, and look, uh, not to make it sound like I'm great at this, I'm learning this too. I'm starting to charge more and more and more and ask for more and more and more. And it's not because, um, it's one, because people are, A, they're just willing to pay more, right? They're happier when they pay more and they, and they it, there's a weird me me mental mechanic when, when people pay cheap, when they pay low prices. And the second thing is I have habitually, uh, consistently, and now for nearly uh, five, six years, undervalued my, my talents. And I'm just sick of that. I now know I'm good. And so I'm like, okay, you're gonna pay for good. Because I've seen what a lot of other creators make and I'm like, they're good enough, but I'm better. So you're gonna pay premium to get premium work. I love that. Yeah. Value your work. And, yeah. and I love the way you said that too. The entrepreneurs wanna be with people who value themselves, value their work, value their price. They don't wanna be around somebody who doesn't value what they do. I think it's they wanna easy be... to get caught up in that. Yeah, they don't want, they, the, the real, the good entrepreneur doesn't want deals, right? This is like, okay, in rehab, in rental real estate, we figured this out really quick. The first thing that everybody does, they go up to hire the cheapest bid. Everybody does this. I need to get this house rehabbed and I'll go get the cheapest bid because, you know, I'm scared and I'm tight on money and, and, um, and, and I'm working with limited resources. So I'm just gonna get the cheapest bid and then you get the shittiest work and then you have to pay somebody else to fix it. it happens every single time. Everybody does it, right? The cheapest way is the most expensive. So do you want to be somebody that charges so little that they have to come out here and like, the, what the entrepreneur thinks when you ch charge too little, they think, I'm going to get the cheap contractor that I have to call the second person to come redo it. That's yeah. what they think. If you just show up and you're confident, and now you have to earn this a little bit, right? You're confident, you're like, I've done a bunch of gigs. You're like, look, it's eight grand. It's 10 grand. You're like, that's a lot. It's like, yeah, I know, I'm great. Right, you got one shot at this piece of content. You got one shot at this conference. You need somebody that's going to deliver. Do you wanna go get somebody for 1200 bucks and hope? And they're sitting there going like, how do I change my F-stop? Oh, I'm just shooting on, they're shooting on auto all day. With right? a kit or lens. You, a kit lens, yeah, they, do they, yeah. Like, hang on. Right? This bad boy costs money. Yeah, right. right. The, entrepreneur yeah. Doesn't, the entrepreneur doesn't know what this does. Right, he doesn't know why that, why that's a $2,400 lens or a $2,200 lens. They don't know what it does, right? Yeah. It's like, I know. Or when I show up with that 85 millimeter 1.2 and I'm like, yo, I'm gonna make images that you didn't know could exist, they're so good. And it's like, yeah. And, and what, if, if I charge you, if I, if I come in and do a, a photo shoot for a day and I bring my 85 millimeter lens, a $3,200 lens, right? It's the best portrait lens that Canon makes. And I charge you 2,500 bucks, it's like, dude, I couldn't even pay for the equipment I brought. There's no way that this, like I, like I can't have this equipment if I don't charge you enough. I, I have to charge you enough to be able to afford the, just the equipment I bring. What if I had to rent it for $200 a day or $300 a day or whatever? No, oh, totally. Yeah, so you gotta like, I'm, I'm learning it too, but you definitely gotta start charging more. Also, again, this is why we go for entrepreneurs, not small business owners. This is, this is the downside of living in a place like Fayetteville. There's nobody that has 10 grand to spend on video content. Sure. Yeah, go where but the money is and get in the right rooms. Go where the money is and get in the right rooms. But then invest where the money makes sense. Don't live in it. Don't, like, there's a lot of opportunity in L.A., but there's also a lot of competition. There's a lot of opportunity in places like Austin, Phoenix, um, Raleigh, uh, every, every other city. Every other city. It's not, <laughs> L.A. is the worst. Um, but you can, invest in, you can invest in Denver still a little bit. You can invest in Austin. You can invest in Phoenix, right? It's hard to invest in L.A., especially uh, like real estate. So I'm coming back to that conversation, but like, how do you blend them? Um, 
like you, you, you definitely probably have to invest out of state, but the internet makes that very easy. You know, I don't own any had, property in Maui. For example. I had one cool, um, one cool win for the week. I wanted to share with you that happened unexpectedly. I got a call from a previous client that was a realtor and we were doing uh, house flip vlogs and house tour videos. And he got an email from somebody that bought his house that said they watched the video and that's why they, they bought the house, you know? And he was attributing it to the, he was like, dude, we sold that house, like, because of the video. And I was like, let's go. And so he wants to uh, start back up making videos because he, he, you know, he, he was, yeah, he is, he's a newbie. I told him, hey, videos work. It just takes one. You don't know who's watching, but it's going to take time. And then after, you know, seven or eight months, he had some personal things happen and wanted to take a break. And he said he'd come back around. I don't know if he would. And then just this last week, one of the houses he sold was uh, from like a video. So he, Dude. uh, so that, that I love that. So, uh, 51 minutes in, if anybody's still watching this, make sure you leave a comment on YouTube so you can let Sean and I know that this is working. If this is useful to you, if this content is useful, if you listen to it for 50 minutes, it must be probably a few people. Make sure you leave a comment so that we know that it's working. The feedback mechanisms really make a big difference with content. Sean, you should get your real estate license. Mm. And that way, when you make content with him, you say, hey, look, um, I want 25% of the commission or whatever. Right? Yeah, can, that's a good can, idea. Yeah, I'll make you the content for free. But if, if we find out that, the, that this thing makes any money, um, or how about this? Um, you know, you pay me, put me on... on like you and you pay me a referral bonus, like if it if it sells. Like he, I don't think he can give you a bonus unless you have your license, something like that. So, but yeah, not the worst idea. That's what um you know. Do you know the guy Ines on uh, YouTube? Ines. No, he does like the do. multi multi millionaire, uh, multi million dollar houses house okay. tours. He's they're crazy good. You got to check this guy out. And what I'm 99 percent sure he does is he just partners with the listing brokers and he's like, look, I have an audience of two three million followers on YouTube now. And all he does is these mega mansions and yachts and whatever. And he tours them and they're like cinematic. They're really good. They are the peak. And it's like him and two, three, I think he's got three video guys, whatever. And um, I'm 99% sure because he lists the broker in there, right? Here's the listing broker, yada, yada, yada. And I'm sure that he gets a piece if they sell from the YouTube. Why wouldn't he? Brilliant. Right. How do you spell his name? Oh, I Enes. cannot pronounce it. Yeah, it's Y-E- Y-N-E-S. Is his first oh, yeah. name? I'll check him out. His last name is um, is something y- Yalzamir. I don't want to say it because okay. it's um, I don't want to. The, the guy seems cool. I don't want to be. A, I don't want to sound like an asshole. Sure. Mispronounce his name. Um, sure. Okay, but the okay. Let's wrap up. This is this is a long episode. Um, super appreciate you. Where can people find you if they want to hire you in Las Vegas uh, for video work? On Vegas, I also travel. Have a passport. Uh, Sean McGuire. S H A W N M A G U I R E. McGuire for hire. McGuire for hire. Okay. Uh, we got to get Where somebody to do find show you? notes for this show. Uh, I'm Alex Scott Felice at everything. Yeah. So, Show notes. Um, we can do that. Yeah. What we're going to do is I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to build a little course. And when that, when that course gets sold, I'm going to hire somebody to help with this content production. I, I dig that. Yeah. No, I was looking into some things too. I, once I kind of get through this... Uh, Next two weeks, the end of my August, I have a little bit more flex time to do some research and kind of dive into some ideas. Um, and I want to put more resources into this. So Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, my dude. Uh, cool, I'm man. I appreciate hey, you. Do I you, appreciate uh, you. I'm glad we didn't mi- I'm glad we almost missed a week. So I'm glad. I, I know. Don't miss. bro. Consistency. Consistent. I love it. I love it. Well, because I'm, I'm trying to make my list, too, of all these guys that I meet where... If they have a good vibe, we can hit them up and get them to join. So I know once yeah. we kind of uh, hit our, our goal with however many we want to do. And then I think once I get my freaking camera to work, then I won't feel yeah, like such a it. schmuck. And yeah, go work can... on it, you piece of shit. Yeah, I know. God damn it. Uh, but did you want to hop on a quick call after we're done recording to talk about one of those edits? If you have time? Uh, I don't. No. Okay. Not today. Okay, cool. Uh, maybe just, later. Sorry. I just wanted to... Remind yeah, you. Yeah, I know. My... I got to make some time for it. No, you're good. Cool, right. cool, cool. Uh, well, hey, have a great day, dude. Be well. I'm going surfing. Oh, sick. Send me pics. <laughs> All right, later. All right, later. Bye.